Good afternoon, Rector, Chancellors, Academic Authorities and Faculty, Visitors and Colleagues. Welcome again to this wonderful ceremony hall. We will now continue this international forum with the first of the three panels of the conference. During these two days, we are discussing and learning about the contribution of universities to SDG 16, peace, justice and strong institutions. This goal is in fact at the very core of our university mission. At Deusto, we understand universities as agents of social change, institutions that, through education and research in different disciplines, seek social transformation, respect for human rights, as well as promotion of justice. They can be, of course, other models of universities, but at Deusto, we believe that a university like ours, here and now, only makes real sense if our teaching and research work is valid to achieve higher standards of justice, equality, and freedom, not only in our closer Basque society, but also in an increasingly uh, globalized planet as a whole. This implies that from this perspective, we are not here to question or to challenge this principle about the university's mission, but to learn and discuss ways in which it can be best and most efficiently carried out specifically in relation to SDG 16. To this end, this conference has been organized around three panels that respond to the role of uh, three relevant types of factors, universities themselves, public institutions, and social organizations. In this first panel, we will address how universities must contribute to the goal of social transformation and commitment through their own academic and organizational policies. This is why the title of the panel is The Academy and the Promotion of Peace and Justice. With this underlying philosophy, we will immediately address the issue of academic or university policies. Policies that should help us to better develop and implement some of the objectives deployed in SDG 16, like the promotion of human rights, peace, social justice, and good governance. To this end, we have the luxury of having brought together three distinguished speakers to whom I would like to welcome once again, as well as thank them for their availability. Their profile is also complementary, both uh, from a geographical and an institutional point of view. We are missing Alana O'Malley, who, was, uh, who uh, is, uh, cannot be here today with us because of a uh, health problem at the very last uh, moment. We send our best energies from here for her. But uh, we have here on the table uh, Mark Charlton, who is Associate Director of Public Engagement at the Montfort uh, University in Leicester in the United Kingdom. Carla Koppel, Distinguished uh, Fellow at the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security, Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., United States. And Jennifer Cartin, Director of the Public Policy Institute at the University of o Auckland, in New Zealand. So welcome again. Uh, I will say to you welcome in Basque as well. Ogie Torri, Scaricasco. Welcome and thank you very much for being here with us. So to open the discussion, I will formulate a very broad first question so you can make an initial general statement, maybe pointing out at the same time some issues or more concrete topics. Obviously, you are not uh, expected to exhaust the topic in the first answer. The pre preliminary question would be how teaching and research may contribute to SDG 16 and how universities should help to that challenge through their academic and organizational policies. So please, Mark, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, well, I'm here um, in my role as uh, the lead for uh, the United Nations Academic Impact uh, Global Hub for SDG 16, which is based at De Montfort University in Leicester, so, and it's the only one of its kind, and we're uh, one year into the, um, into the, the process of, of being the hub, so we're kind of getting to know exactly uh, what it means to, to have this responsibility. And um, what um, I've really learned over that, that time is that SDG 16 is the great enabler of all the other SDGs, uh, so one way to look at it would be that without uh, SDG 16 you couldn't have uh, uh, zero poverty 
or you couldn't tackle hunger if a country's at war. And if you go through all the SDGs, you can understand that without peace, justice, and strong institutions, you um, cannot achieve the other SDGs. So that's kind of how we framed it at the university to make sure that we hit SDG 16 and uh, that we um, also focus on all 17 SDGs because that is important too. Um, the, the title of this uh, session is kind of the challenge that has been given to me by the UNAI, so uh, how, how we do uh, promote this work uh, across the university. Um, really, I think we're uh, six years in now to the, uh, the global goals, and people are, are kind of sick of theory and they want action. In fact, the uh, United Nations have now announced a decade of action, so... Um, I'll just talk to you briefly about what we've done to try and stimulate some action within the university, which I hope that you might be able to copy or, or, or inspire you to do something similar. So we've created a circumstance where teaching and research is framed around opportunities to impact SDGs, particularly SDG 16, because that's our hub status. Uh, we've also developed uh, uh, service learning modules which are much rounded actually in uh, North American universities uh, as a way of learning, but we've, we've developed this to try and uh, have SDG impacts within uh, modules. Um, we also have worked hard at trying to create great visibility of SDG 16 so people really understand it. And also, we've formulated a, a governance level, a committee across the university of teachers, researchers, and practitioners who are committing to the SDGs and sharing their work so that there's a, um, a, a central message uh, flowing through the university that this is important and this, this is uh, uh, what our work is about when we uh, seek to achieve global impact. So. Um, I went to New York briefly uh, before Christmas to talk about our progress in this uh, hub uh, status and the mood in New York. So for the first year, I've been kind of trying to develop projects that hit a sweet spot of uh, lots of students getting involved in activities, lots of uh, research outcomes and uh, impact uh, based around a good project idea linked to SDG 16. But what the, the UN, uh, the mood in the UN was, that, that's great, don't stop doing that, but you are also an institution with 25,000 students who come in to the university every day, and they were very explicit in the idea that our role in this is really to empower that generation of uh, young people to, to go on and do things that are linked to social justice and, and social impact. Um, so I hope from today uh, um, we actually come up with something um, in this decade of action that actually is an action that we don't just leave the conversation here, that we can go back to our universities and stimulate more ideas. Um, so I guess that's me. Okay. Ms. Jennifer. Ina mana, ina reo, ero aparangi ma, tena koto. Kei te waikato i whakatapuo, no kirikiri roa aho, kei te whare wānanga o tamaki makauro aho e mahi ana. Ko Jennifer Curtin tōku ingoa, tēnakana koutou, tēna koutou, tēna koutou katoa. Thank you, Professor Ruiz. To all the dignitaries here, Rector Gibea, Phil Batty, and to the delegates, greetings, greetings to everyone from our Indigenous people as well as myself. I'd like to take this opportunity first to thank Maya and the staff at the University of Dusto for their manakitanga, their hospitality, and to Sarah and colleagues for their invitation to participate at this prestigious event. I'm honoured to be here in the beautiful Basque region on World Social Justice Day. My name's Jennifer and I was born and raised in the Waikato region of Aotearoa, New Zealand. My PhD in early academic work was in Australia, so I spent 13 years there before returning home. I'm now a professor of politics and public policy at the University of Auckland, and I'm the inaugural director of the Public Policy Institute. 
Te Whare Maria Tatri Kopapa. The Public Policy Institute is committed to engaging with stakeholders and fostering cross-disciplinary, independent, critical, evidence-informed research on policy issues affecting New Zealanders and the global community. The views I offer here today are my own. I'd also note that as context, I am a Pākehā, white, middle-class, university-educated, cis, het woman with status in my institution. So I am speaking to you from a position of privilege, significant privilege, that unconsciously or otherwise informs my comments here. Briefly, what I want to do in my last, in my first few moments, is um, t is to talk about two aspects. I want to talk about the University of Auckland as an institution and give you our um, positioning on SDG. I've been there 14 years now, and so I feel like I'm in a good position to to reflect on some of that. But second, I want to emphasise that while it's important for formal institutions like universities to have good rules and practices with mechanisms for accountability, these institutional arrangements are just one part of the social transformation agenda. The other part of the story is about those who work in this arena, the individual scholars and professional staff who are in many instances already committed to the cause of social change and community well-being through their everyday practices as teachers and researchers and in the curriculum that they build. So if I look first at the universities as an institution, a formal institution, the University of Auckland is a research-led comprehensive teaching university. This means that we teach almost every subject and offer courses and programs from foundation studies so pre-degree through to PhD. We have 41,000 students, 5,500 staff, 2,400 of whom are academics. We're a public university funded primarily through government monies, taxpayer money. We have low level fees and interest-free loans for domestic students and our additional income comes from external research and international student enrolments. Philanthropy is growing, but it's yet to become a reliable income stream for the core business of universities in New Zealand. This means we face real challenges um, in ensuring that our students feel included when class sizes grow relative to the number of teaching staff. In 2019, the inaugural year of the Times Higher Ed Global Impact Rankings on the University's engagement with Sustainable Development Goals the University of Auckland was ranked number one. We ranked number seven on SDG 16. We do have a raft of policies, codes of conduct, guidelines, dedicated teams and units aimed at promoting equity, inclusion, health, well-being, and personal safety, as well as environmental sustainability and engagement with local, regional, national, and international stakeholders. Our government arra governance arrangements include committees and bodies that have elected staff and students and which work to hold university hierarchies to account. And the regulatory environment of higher education in New Zealand requires us to review our programs of study and the quality of our research on a regular basis. Our peak non-profit organisation, the Royal Society, Te Aparangi, is committed to diversity and inclusion in research and it supports scholars and society in the exploration, discovery and dissemination of knowledge. But as some of you may know and be aware from my introduction, our work in New Zealand um, as an institution and the governments too is underpinned by a founding document called the Treaty of Waitangi. It was signed by our indigenous people, the Māori, and representatives of the Crown in 1840. And as such, the University of Auckland, through its formal documents, recognises the special relationship we have with Māori in Aotearoa and the 19 mana whenua, the iwi, the tribes of Tamaki Makoro, Auckland, and the relationship we must continue to build with them. And as SDG would, 16 would require us to think about 
we still have a lot of work to do in forming a trust rich relationship with our Indigenous peoples and including them into our higher education system in a way that recognises that their worldview is not necessarily in sync with the Western dominant hegemonic worldview that informs our traditional university institutions. At the Public Policy Institute, our commitment to the treaty includes a commitment to ensuring all aspects of our research, teaching and external activities support and engage with what we call mātauranga Māori, Māori wisdom, Māori worldviews and Māori knowledge, and the goals of Māori self-determination and development. Auckland is an unusual city. It's home to over one-third of the country's population. It, has the biggest it is the biggest Polynesian city in the world, and there are over 100 languages spoken there. And the university is one of the city's what we call anchor institutions that brings with it a large responsibility to advance the SDGs. We are in the last year of our current strategic plan, seven years they last for, and our, ours finishes this year in 2020. We also have a new university president, vice-chancellor, arriving next month. Both of these moments, our new strategic planning um, year, and an arrival of a new president um, represent an opportunity, I believe, to revisit the mission objectives and our commitments to SDG 16 and to our indigenous peoples, our multi-ethnic communities and our diverse student body. I just want to turn briefly to the shift from the formal measures that, that Phil talked about earlier and, and to something a little bit more on the informal side of institutions. So we know that ranking systems um, focus on key performance indicators that can be counted. I trained as a political scientist in comparative politics and public policy, and we learn and we teach others that in order to make comparisons, we have to take our analysis up to the macro level, the broad character, categories, and we seek measures that reflect the definitions provided to us that then give us an opportunity to do systematic cross-national comparison. In supplying evidence to support these measures, we choose examples that are exemplars, those that have the highest profile or which are the most influential. But what these large comparative studies and the building of indicators miss is what happens at the grassroots of the university, the informal side that makes universities strong institutions in advancing peace and justice. There is much work already being undertaken by teachers and researchers which advances social transformation because it is part of their everyday working lives. It is labour that is often unseen, often undervalued, and it can be difficult to measure using conceptual frameworks that we currently use. Sometimes there is localised academic resistance to measurement because data collection comes with additional requirements, monitoring, auditing, performance targets. Universities can be greedy institutions in that regard. But the collective work of those individual teachers and researchers remains vitally important to fostering external engagement and cultural and social inclusion. So I think it would be useful for us to think about ways to better represent and perhaps um, to count things that are currently uncounted, not unlike um, women's unpaid labour and the work of Marilyn Waring um, when she talked about counting for nothing and the work that's often unpaid is undervalued. So if, perhaps if we gave some of this more attention, some behavioural contagion effects might result. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you also for bringing us the sound of the Maori language. I guess maybe it's the first time in history that the Maori language is spoken in this, in this room. <laughs> it is my but, uh, cultural and linguistic diversity is something we normally celebrate, but most of the times we celebrate it through a single language. So it's good to have this, this, this uh, reference to the Maori language as well. So thank you. Now it's please, your turn. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to Times Higher Education, University of Teatro. I should um, say I'll talk with you tomorrow uh, a bit more about the work that we're doing within 
the Institute, and the reason I think I'm here is because in addition to being a fellow of the Institute, I direct a program working with about 25 institutions across the United States working on issues of uh, equity and inclusion uh, in public policy and international affairs education. So we'll talk more about that. I was listening to your question and my colleague's answer to the question about how we can contribute or how universities in general can contribute to SDG 16. And I, I should say, um, you know, as somebody who's working at, at one institute within the university and then and teaching within the School of Foreign Service, I should preface anything I'm going to say, which may be a little controversial, is say that I'm speaking for myself um, and not for the whole of Georgetown University. Um, I think there's two ways you could look at, uh, you could look at how Georgetown digests the SDGs or can advance the SDGs through a positive glass half full lens or a glass half empty lens. So if we look at it from a positive standpoint, um, where I work at the Institute for Women, Peace and Security is very much the manifestation of a crosswalk of SDGs on, on particularly gender um, and peace and conflict resolution. And so it is a living and breathing example of how universities can advance this agenda. And, and we have extensive work, whether that is research, partnerships with governments, with the United Nations and others, um, as well as uh, teaching and learning around um, these issues. So it's, it's very explicit. But if I look at it through a glass half empty lens, what I can say is that we have a particular challenge in the United States where sustainable development goals are really to a very limited extent on the national agenda um, and barely talked about at a, at a national level. And so what we've seen is a devolution of the focus on the SDGs to cities and states, communities and individual schools who are engaging um, but um, but are engaging really because they're invested and interested in demonstrating continued U.S. commitment um, to the movement within the global community and to advancing that movement. And that's not to say that there aren't many, many people who are working towards advancing the SDGs. I just think there has to be a cognizance here in Europe uh, with regard to how little the SDGs are spoken about. Um, at a national level in the United States. And as somebody in Washington, D.C., and as a university in Washington, D.C., that has a, an effect on, on, the, on the discourse we face um, today. Uh, that having been said, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of good progress and a lot of ways in which work around the SDGs, whether it's labeled explicitly work on SDGs or not, is moving forward. So um, we, for example, just put in place a certificate on gender, peace, and security uh, at Georgetown as a, as a focus of con and a concentration of study for people who are getting graduate degrees. Um, we are doing a lot of research on filling data gaps, and we focus particularly on gender issues, but I think there's enormous opportunity to fill other data gaps that currently exist uh, around the range of issues. And then I think that there's an important gaps in, in, in particularly interdisciplinary learning. What I find with regard to the SDGs at Georgetown, for example, is that there's a much higher level of awareness among those who are focused on development and advancing development around, global development around the world, as opposed to those who are focused on security studies or are focused on uh, diplomacy. And so enabling there to be, particularly around SDG 16, an ability for everybody to really be touched by the power of 16, but more generally the SDGs to drive uh, conflict prevention, resolution, and reconstruction, I think offers important opportunities to really change the next generation of leaders so that the commitment not only to the single SDG but to the crosswalks is one which is abiding not just over the next decade when we're, when we're doing this initial period of measurement, but when we're looking beyond that to how we have transformative interventions that are, um, that are changing the way we're approaching uh, sustainable development and peace building uh, writ large. So perhaps I'll start there. Let's stop there so that we can have more of a conversation. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the concerns that uh, I would like to put on the table is that, well, we believe in this mission of the universities, but uh, we have to live in a world in which uh, we have this tension between so-called academic excellence and social transformation. So how do we make the goals of a, this kind of academic excellence and social transformation compatible? In, a com in an environment which is very competitive, uh, universities including basically productivity, rankings, evaluations of one particular sort. So how can we really uh, 
uh, embrace the fact that my role of teaching and research is social transformation. Uh, how can we invite, promote our colleagues to, to work or to, to, to devote their efforts to, to this point and, uh, and in a world in which uh, we are pressed by these uh, so-called academic excellence rankings? Yes. Well, I think uh, the SDGs present an opportunity, really, not a not attention. I, I think it's a matter of persuading uh, faculty staff uh, um, to engage in it because the majority of uh, SDG targets uh, would really demonstrate social impact and that's what, what the agenda for universities uh, is, is increasing really, that people want to see that universities are um, of value to society. That's uh, um, Phil uh, alluded to it in his opening speech that universities are kind of un under fire or, or under question constantly at the moment. But one thing that we can really do to defend those criticisms is to demonstrate our impact in wider society. And I think the SDGs actually present a framework for creating that impact because they're actually outlining some of the biggest social problems in the world or societal problems in the world. And how we approach it um, collectively is uh, um, an opportunity because the SDGs creates a global language um, which uh, universities can adopt and, and collaborate and work together and, and, and focus on uh, the same targets. Uh, so I think there's a real opportunity there. And, and don't you find problems to measure this impact? I mean, how do we uh, measure the impact, the social transformation impact, and how make it uh, attractive also for individual academics who have to, to fight uh, to, to be uh, qualified for, other, for, for promotion through other kind of rankings? Obviously, there is, there is a tension there. Uh, but, um, again, the, the SDGs offer a, a framework with impact uh, uh, indicators and targets. So I think that it's, in, in some cases, the piece of work that needs to be done is enabling the academic to understand how their work relates to the SDGs. I've had a lot of circumstances over the last uh, 12 months and some of the best SDG 16 work done at my university has been done by people who had no idea they were doing it. So it's a matter of educating people and, and the idea of precisely what uh, the SDGs are and how their work relates to it. Thank you. Jennifer, please. Yeah, I think, I, I agree. I think the SDGs are an opportunity for universities to potentially, for our university, I, I should stick for, to, to my own case, um, to, to think about the, what they value um, at the individual level. So, I mean, I don't know how it works in Europe, but in, in New Zealand, our employment contracts are 40% research, 40% teaching, 20% service and or administration and it's very delineated and really if we were following this, it, it, taking insights from the, from the ranking system but the SDG 16 more generally, then, then we not only would we see more interdisciplinary work or cross-disciplinary work, we'd also see um, more measurable connections between these three pieces of our working life rather than, which is where I fear New Zealand is going, which is mimicking the, the REF exercise in the UK where we are going to have to start to measure our own individual research impact, which adds another burden to the academic to then develop their own individual case narratives of how they have impacted. And, and we are concerned that this will benefit senior scholars over junior scholars more because it takes quite a lot of time to develop your research and your teaching to then be able to demonstrate broader social impact if you're measuring it in very specific ways. But in fact, we know that when we hear the individual stories from academics about what they're already doing, um, particularly our indigenous and Pacifica scholars who who have 
um, much more embedded in their own practice, um, reciprocal relationships with their communities. They always are giving back to their own individual, com to their communities, the, the research knowledge and the translation work that they do themselves. And they do that without recognition from the traditional measurement systems. So I think actually, you know, we've inherited a lot uh, from the US and the UK, but we need to also learn a lot more from our own communities, our local communities about what to value, that, that different worldviews have bring different understandings and these can inform the implementation of SDGs. Do you? Carla, I'll be a little bit provocative. Why not? <laughs> um, I, I think that in theory, the SDGs provide great opportunities for interdisciplinary work, for collaborative work, and for partnerships. But I think that the reality that I see is that, a little bit to your point, Jennifer, that the reality is that within the structure of the system of these academic institutions, it's really hard to get these things actually mainstreamed into uh, into curricula, into teaching, and into research. So there are institutes that are doing this work, there are academics who are interested in these topics, but if you look at the canon within international affairs, um, in much of public policy, economics, um, these issues, these social justice issues are not mainstreamed, at least in the United States. Um, and it's very hard to get it there. I'm, I work with a group of, this group of deans. Um, they are all interested, and I'm gonna, I'm moving a little bit, it's the spirit of the SDGs rather than literally the SDGs, so e issues of equity and inclusion. And the reason they're all working together so hard to try to move this agenda forward is because it's really hard to move this agenda forward. Um, uh, these issues are relatively newer. The most senior faculty, in many cases, did not grow up learning about these things. Uh, there's very little incentive framework to push them to include them in their, in their teaching or in their research. Um, often, these are all generalizations. There are tremendous exceptions. Um, but the incentives you're talking about are not stacked in favor of bringing these topics into the mainstream. Um, or ensuring that every student touches these issues as they're going through the educational process. And I think it's, it's difficult to get there. I mean, that, that's the, the feedback I get from the institutions I'm working with who really want to do this. They are from all over the country. They are elite and less so, big, small. It's hard. Um, so I think, I, I think measurement is one concern, but I think the bigger concern is really how we how we get this to be a whole of institution um, engagement with SDGs and with these issues more broadly. In, in relation to this, um, so how can the goal of social transformation be effectively incorporated into the strategic plans of the universities? And for that, do we need to create specific structures or units within the universities? You refer to a committee level, for instance. Uh, do we need to create something specific? It's, it's better to create a specific unit in charge of that, or if not, if that's not the case, how, how can we ensure that the social responsibility is assumed by the governing bodies or by the whole university or the whole university community? So what is the best option, to create a specific units or more cross-faculty, cross-school units or cross-school cross strategies or policies at the university level? What, what, do, what is your opinion on that? Well. We're doing this to some degree in that um, we have formed a, a committee and we have developed modules now that contain SDGs uh, designed to impact SDGs, different SDGs for different uh, uh, courses and disciplines. But there's also a, a piece of work uh, um, that we did prior to that. Uh, in the United Kingdom, the National Union of Students every year does uh, a, an annual questionnaire um, to students about why they came to the university and what they want to see uh, the, um, in their degrees. 
um, and it's, it's public data, it's all online, but 76% of young people who came to our university and our university wasn't particularly different from uh, the majority of other universities. They actually wanted sustainable development within their education. So there's an, um, uh, an element here of responsiveness to uh, what young people want to learn uh, in their degrees. So there's, there's a will there from, from the young people to, to learn about this stuff at the bottom grassroots level, but at the top level, um, we need to, um, I, I think universities need to have a, a, a more top-down approach because if the, uh, the, the vice chancellor and the executive board see this as a vision for the university, it's much easier for things to get done rather than uh, groups of willing staff, for, like, like you mentioned, who are doing uh, exceptional things but in isolation. So really to have it flowing through the institution uh, from a governance level, I think, is a really important thing. Mm -hmm. What is the view from the other part of the world? I, I quite like the idea of needing the this, this super high level political will. And so I work um, on gender diversity and public policy in my own research. And I'm currently working on a, a project that's about trying to design a gender budgeting, gender responsive budgeting strategy for New Zealand so that the financial processes take gender and diversity into account. Um, and I've been having conversations with the OECD about doing this because there are quite, you know, this is the beauty of knowledge transfer across countries, right? You go to these meetings and you talk to each other and, and you learn some strategies. And talking to the OECD who have a lot of information about what other countries do, I learned you know, the different ways in which a best practice or a good practice model could be implemented. And this is that you need this high level political will in the first instance. But what we also know is that, that those individual um, academics, the mid-level managers, if you like, if we were talking about a bureaucracy, and the university kind of is one, right? Um, they're really important in the implementation process of these high-level political statements so, and commitments. So I suppose if I was thinking about what we'd need, I, I'm not sure we would want another specific unit or a specific structure dedicated to the SDGs because we have so many units already, equity units and, and you know, other sorts of units within the university that are, that are at the central level trying to to promulgate good practice. But what I do think is because we're in this moment of a new strategic plan for the next seven years and this new vice chancellor coming in, that actually there's a lot of that we teach about co-design. This is a thing in public policy where you put the people that are likely to be impacted by policies together with the policy makers and you have conversations about what they would like to see in terms of a policy and its process of implementation. So it got me thinking about why don't we do our strategic planning like this? Why don't instead of the high level people drafting the document and giving it out through the email list for consultation and everybody's really busy and can't do it, maybe we should flip the process and start with talking about what do you want to see in the strategic plan and let's put this together and that's the opportunity to bring our indigenous people in and our multi ethnic communities in as well. So that's the first thing I'd think about you know, implementing. The other thing I would really like to see if, if our universities have to collect this evidence for, well, we're talking 2021 now, the 2021 round of the Times Higher Ed Global Impact Rankings, that maybe it would be really great if they had a, a little place, a, an incubator or a lab or something where in addition to the policies and the numerics, we could come in as staff and tell them our social transformation stories. Because what we know about the way governments like to, to do work now is that yes, evidence is about data, but data can be stories. And storytelling is a really important way of convincing people why they should come on board and why what they do is valued actually. So they need to have the, the, a place to come and talk about what they're already doing in this space. That's, that's my theoretical model in my mind of what might be po possible. I have 
zero influence in my institution to implement such a thing. Although I did just get elected to the governing body of my university, so my term starts <laughs> next month. Maybe I can, I can flex you. some muscle. <laughs> Great. Yes, um, so I think, first of all, I wanted to echo what Mark said about the change being student driven, because we see exactly the same thing in the United States. The students are the ones who are demanding a focus on this set of issues, whether they label it SDGs or not. They're really um, important incentivizers, levers, stakeholders, um, who are the ones that are pushing for change. Um, I think the answer is both. I mean, that is, you need to have individual institutes, departments, entities within universities that are creating cells that move this agenda forward. Institute for Women, Peace and Security is a, a, an anchor for work on some of these issues at Georgetown, but there are others. And I think they are not only important centers for focused research, they're also um, really valuable home bases for students who are dedicated to these issues. Um, and they're also incubators for things that then move out across the, the, gro the, the broader community. So I just had uh, lunch with uh, several of our academic administrators about how we build out the work that is going on at the institute across the school as a whole. If, if the institute weren't there, that those conversations wouldn't be happening. Um, at the same time, I do think you need to figure out how you create drivers, central drivers. So for example, at Georgetown, um, we don't have a focus per se that I know of on the SDGs, but there was put in place a requirement related to diversity and inclusion for undergraduate classes. So that students needed to take a certain uh, classes related one to domestic issues of, of diversity and one international issues of diversity in, before completing their studies. And the courses need to be certified. And so that was one centralized effort to try to ensure that, um, that there is some sort of transformation that's taking place in the way that we're looking at issues and the extent to which uh, issues related to, um, to inclusion are incorporated into teaching and learning. Now, is that optimal? No, but it's, it's the kind of example of something which um, begins to drive change forward. Another example, small example that came out of the work that I'm doing with other universities is including uh, course evaluation questions uh, related to topics that you're concerned about. So asking about whether or not courses are touching on either the SDGs explicitly or issues embedded in the SDGs would be a way to start to create an incentive effect on the way syllabi are put together. So there are a lot of these um, levers that you can you can introduce that begin to shape the way the curriculum moves um, over time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we are talking about uh, tensions, tension between so-called academic excellence and social transformation, about uh, specific or more generic organization. Now I put on the table another tension, the tension between direct intervention by the university versus networking or collaboration with other social entities. So should universities create their own social campus branch of direct intervention within the fields of knowledge, for instance, units of, for social intervention, legal clinics, provision of psychological or health care for vulnerable people, direct economic, economic, financial, or technological support for disadvantaged uh, groups, or is it a better option to network with other kind of uh, social entities or to integrate university transfer into existing public services. Um, this is another tension. Let's try not to be so moderate to be in the middle and to say both of them. Um, what would be your option? <laughs> uh, for me, um, after eight long years of doing this kind of thing, that partnership working is by far the most robust way of doing it, in my opinion. Um, and I say that for, uh, not because uh, SDG 17 is an SDG partnerships for the goals, that's an easy win, <laughs> but uh, actually because um, you're enabling your students to engage with people who have uh, an expertise and an expert uh, and, uh, and access to a community that you want to work with. Uh, often universities are uh, seen as um, places that aren't necessarily accessible uh, by everyone, 
So a, a good partnership uh, NGO or charity is often a good connector to a community that you want to work with. Also, um, in my experience of working with uh, the charity sector, um, supplying students as volunteers and, and service learning and things like that, the, the um, organi partner organisation is actually set up to support those students. So where, where um, if I were leading a project uh, without uh, a, a partner, I would be responsible for the boundary training. So if, if our students were going to work with homeless people, for example, it would be the university's responsibility to find the appropriate training for that group of students. If you work with an NGO, they uh, work with homeless people all the time. They have a framework for training. They willingly want the volunteers to participate and therefore take away that headache of boundary t training, uh, DBS checks. Uh, d that's like a UK thing of, of saying if some, somebody's appropriate to work within uh, with uh, vulnerable people. Um, so there's, there's a, it, ta it actually takes away a lot of the um, a lot of the bureaucracy around working with hard to reach communities, and also um, in my experience, it sort of doubles the impact of your work. Uh, in that it, it increases the profile. The, typically the charity or NGO is delighted to be aligned with the university doing this work, but also it demonstrates to the public that the university has a, uh, a, a will and a way of working with local established community partners to create impact and social good. So in my, if I had, if I had to pick one of the two methods, because we have done we have done interventions with no partners, so we've done law clinics, for example, without, without local partners. Uh, but if I, was, if I was asked to pick one of the two, it would be a no-brainer. It would be partner, partnerships every time. Okay, very well, really clear. Yeah, I think, um, I think we still have a lot of work to do in this area. I think partnerships and networks are really valuable, and, and I think... Um, what it does is it grows an intergenerational connection between the university and it's the community in which it ours as an anchor institution. But, but I think there are real challenges. So, you know, a lot of the relationships that our staff, our, our academics have with partners may be in that informal space. And, and these, ta these require a, a lot of effort and a lot of energy and if that person then leaves, then, then you have to reset the partnership. Um, so internships and service learning are a really critical part of, of what we're still trying to do. We, we're, it's not across the board yet, but, but we have a, a mission to, to ensure that every student graduates with some kind of experience outside of the classroom, indeed an international experience if we can support those students who come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds in, in getting that. But, but I'm just not sure that that's enough. And, um, and we, for us at the University of Auckland, we are not a capital city. So this means our, our government is situated in quite a long way away from us. And we would like our researchers to have better access to policy makers. And we know that our policy makers would like better access to our academics. But we haven't fully worked out a way to put all these people together um, and so when new academics come and they come to our Public Policy Institute and they're like, we want, to have, we want our research to have impact. Um, get, ha set that up for me. And we're like, well, it doesn't really work like that. It's relationship driven and this, this takes time. And particularly with our indigenous communities, um, there is a long history of people wanting input from, our, from Māori and then walking away with that knowledge and that, and not giving back and not building a trust for relationship with those communities. And that's something um, I believe our university has to, to work much harder at um, so that we are not exploiting knowledge holders for the benefit of our research um, that we're, we're giving back. But um, so, so I think the partnerships are essential. I just don't think partnerships Growing those partnerships and re and and keeping them live is an easy task. It requires resource from the highest level um, to keep it enabled. 
Right. Thank you. From I'm going to give you an unsatisfactory answer. Yeah. I think it depends on your goal. I mean, what it is you're trying to do. I think that the examples that Mark and Jennifer gave are great, and the, both of the challenges and the advantages of the partnerships. But for example, if you're only working through partnerships, then you're not touching the people who are not interested in partnerships. So if your goal is really to reach the entire university ecosystem, then you need to work through the systems within that ecosystem to get that change. So I, I start from an outcome-based um, analysis of which one is best, and I would say that then if you, if, you, if you look at different sets of goals, then you're gonna have different optimal ways of um, working and operationalizing uh, to meet that goal. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't so, give you a yes or no. It's okay. We need some uh, food for thought, so we need uh, different uh, inputs. Uh, you have insisted um, in engaging students into these policies, but many times we, from the universities we face with the structural barriers. Uh, they may be legal, for instance, because uh, refugees or foreign people uh, they may not have uh, documents or may not have the titles recognized to be able to be enrolled in our degrees or our universities. We face social barriers, uh, for instance, with uh, stigmatized uh, ethnic minorities. We talk here about the Roma people in this country or the travelers in Ireland or the UK or indigenous peoples in other countries. Uh, some uh, religious minorities as well, so it's, it's, sometimes it's, it's difficult for, for Muslim people, for instance, to, to enroll into, in, in universities, or economic barriers, clear economic barriers, which uh, make difficult for disadvantaged social sectors to, to, to approach the university. So do you have any successful story or best practice to, to, to share with us ideas, proposals, suggestions? I would be very welcome on how to deal with these structural barriers from the universities. Well, in, in the United Kingdom, we have a system uh, called widening participation, which is uh, a, a government social contract with the university to try and uh, encourage hard to reach groups uh, to come into university. Typically, people uh, um, view it as how we bring in people from deprived backgrounds into the university, but actually the policy of widening participation covers the key areas uh, um, that, that you, you've said, that you've suggested. Um, I don't necessarily think universities are focused uh, enough on trying to bring in uh, audiences from beyond uh, the uh, areas of deprivation. So. Um, there are some significant gaps that need filling, but I do, I do think that there's a frame, in the United Kingdom at least, there is a framework to bring uh, um, people from different backgrounds into university, and that is by taking the university out into those communities and engaging those communities in the work of uh, academia. And um, this is actually typically done with people at quite a, a young age and uh, planting the idea of the university at, say, primary school age and then developing it over time. So there are strategies for doing that. I don't know the statistical data for how many members of the travelling community do participate. I know a fellow PhD uh, of mine at uh, De Montfort University is from the travellers community, so uh, I think there's potential uh, that the we, we have been able to reach out, but there's a, in, in the UK, I think we're quite lucky and we've got a framework to, to work to. It's just, are the, are the universities fully exploring that responsibility to, uh, to do that? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I could, I could but we'd be more depending on the legal framework, so the, the public authorities' policies, than on the university themselves. Yeah, so, so you are so much, uh, you are to some extent obliged to fulfill this. this, this legislation, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, we are not talking now about uh, something which is in a specific policy of the university itself. So there could it, be differences between British universities as yeah. well in terms of... It is policy driven, but also it's a huge benefit to the university to bring different people from different backgrounds to the university, so I, I don't know why the university wouldn't uh, pursue that with uh, uh, vigour, but 
I, um, I just don't know specifically um, if universities are doing enough to target um, different communities. I know from, uh, so I live in a very multicultural city, which uh, Phil mentioned earlier, Leicester is, is about 300,000 people living in Leicester and 200,000 of those actually uh, migrated to Leicester in the last 20 years. It's a hugely ethnic diverse city and this is part of our university's identity, is uh, uh, serving those uh, young people from those communities. So we have got high levels of uh, Muslim, Sikh, Hindu uh, students at the university. Um, whether we've done enough to uh, target other communities, I don't know. But my gut feeling is we probably have, as a, as a university sector in the United Kingdom, we probably haven't. But uh, I couldn't say that with any qualification. Okay, thank you. Jennifer? Yeah, I think we have some, we have some interesting challenges. So, like Leicester, Auckland is, is um, a very multi-ethnic city. Uh, we have a, one and a half million live there. It's, a, it's, a, it's ranked, I think, third for, since we're talking rankings, most livable city. It's also one of the most expensive cities in the world to live in. You know, livable cities are often expensive cities because the rankings are designed to attract global players. So, so and 50%, approximately 50% of our population were born overseas. Um, so, so we we have these, and we have high levels of poverty, of homelessness, of um, domestic violence, um, child poverty, food insecurity. So, so we. We have a lot of challenges as an institution. So it's about students from different backgrounds, but it's also potential students who are coming from um, a very vulnerable place in terms of their own personal well-being before they even consider coming to New Zealand. And those are about policy settings, but, but the University of Auckland has been try, I suppose, I don't know if the outcomes count as success, make them success stories yet, but we have rejigged some things so some of our so our scholarship system is now um, trying to be more fine-grained in terms of not just being the best and the brightest and the captain of the SOC team but also taking account of socio-economic status and building into the scholarship um, their first year in a residence in a halls of residence where they um, to some extent are extracted from their local environment and um, and the responsibilities for some, com for some um, students that come with that, so they get to leave their family responsibilities, if you like, for a little while, and they don't have to fund their first year of accommodation and they're fed and watered, and, and they have um, mentors um, from our two Akana mentors, so our senior Māori will mentor um, Māori students, Pacifica students, and so on. So, so there, are, there are more efforts being made to, to put in place concrete strategies, I think, to support those who might otherwise feel alienated by an elite institution. Um, but, it, but like Mark, I'd say there's still a lot more that, that we should be doing. Um, one thing I would just say is I do think too that, that some of the fine grain research that's coming out of the social sciences, arts and humanities is really important um, to prompt government to think about resetting certain things. So for example, just a couple of days ago, some new research came out of Auckland um, that talks about period poverty. And so we, what we know is that young girls from low socioeconomic backgrounds lose one day of school a month due to not being able to cope with their periods. Now this is really important social science lived experience research that governments might not actually know about. Um, and it's through social media actually getting a lot more attention. Um, and hopefully this will prompt something that might be seen as a very small policy setting, um, but could really improve the quality of these young girls' lives so that then they feel more able to, to come to university and, and do well. Great. Carla, please. So I think this is a really important issue and I think that it exists, I think there are two dimensions to it. So I think one is how are you attracting and retaining students of diverse backgrounds, whether that's uh, ethnic or religious or socioeconomic. 
Um, I think the other is what is the climate on campuses that enables them and a diverse student population to thrive. And with the increasing polarization of discourse in a lot of places around the world, and I can speak to it from the United States, that creates particular dynamics about how you create a, an inclusive culture for conversations among people of diverse backgrounds um, within the school and the academic environment, because otherwise what you're doing is you're, you're actually not benefiting fully from the diversity that you have on, on campus. Um, and so one of the things that we've learned is we, in the United States and at Georgetown specifically, started to admit a, a wider, diverse, more diverse population, a lot of what we call first generation students, so the first that were going to school in the, at college in their family uh, or graduate school in their family, um, and realized that we were then losing a lot of them. And so in terms of the strategies we needed to adopt, it was much more wraparound services for students who had um, come in without the support networks and the knowledge of what it means to be in a university in order to, and, and to thrive there. Um, there was recently a book, I can't remember the name of it, but I can find it if you're interested, from a, um, an African-American uh, student who had gone to Harvard and, and he's doing research into these new generation students and he said, look, it's as simple as things like the term office hours for anybody who grew up with, in the United States, uh, office hours or when you can go and visit a professor when they're sitting there willing to receive you. Um, he said, but office hours were perceived by a lot of first generation students to be the time when their professor's offices were closed and they were working in their office and didn't want to see you. Um, so the very most basic terminological things, they weren't finding out about. Um, when I was looking at professionals in international affairs in my, you know, chapter of, one chapter of my career at uh, the U.S. Development Cooperation Agency, what we, we analyzed where we were losing diverse professionals who were all where these students were ending up. What we realized was that the problem was that their writing, they weren't getting through the writing tests. And you see that at the school as well. They needed more mentorship. They needed more assistance with writing to bring their skills up to the level of the other students who were there. Um, what we're seeing with increased international students and, and refugees and migrants is that often they're there on scholarship. And, and Jennifer and I were just talking about this. And then there's an exchange rate shift. And they don't have the money to eat. Uh, so the deans I'm speaking with are dealing with food insecurity on campus and what that food insecurity um, translates to particularly over school breaks when there's intercession and the cafeteria closes and there's nowhere for these students to eat um, because they can't afford to go home. Uh, and so there are endless sort of practical tips and things to be aware of when you're nurturing an increasingly diverse um, back, you know, set of students on your campus, and the same is true for an increasingly diverse set of staff and faculty. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we're running short of time, but I would like to open the floor for the audience in case anybody wants to make any remark, comment, or question. I suggest we collect through three questions, so you can answer them globally. Uh, is anybody willing to... Yes, there is a lady there. Thank you. I'm Giovanna from Trinity College Dublin. Thank you for a lovely panel. I would like to make two questions if possible. So the first one is the tension between research freedom and the promotion of any of the SDGs and particularly 16. And also the second is um, Jennifer mentioned that there is a, a, an additional burden when we're adopting impact uh, measures, let's say. Uh, what would be creative ways for us to capture impact without burdening our staff and professors that are already very strained? I would love to hear from the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, additional questions, comments, remarks? Yes, please. Uh, Sean Ewan, the University of Melbourne, um, and I'm, this will help you understand my question. I'm responsible for the Indigenous strategy at the University. Carla, you said change was difficult, or you might have said transformation was hard. I mean, and you were trying to be provocative. I'd be interested 
for you to be a bit more provocative and tell us why it's hard. A very superficial outside version of Georgetown is you've done amazing things on uh, issues of reparations. But is that just performative or is it actually transformative? Any last uh, question? If not, I give the floor to my guests. And so whatever you want, I mean, you can uh, maybe, Carla, you want to start? Sure. Um, so I, on the first issue of research freedom and, 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 um, and pushing for consideration of the SDGs, I think you would also add the issue of academic freedom within the classroom and pushing for adoption of certain issues within the classroom. Um, and I think that um, both are challenging and uh, often the most successful strategies have been to work with people who are allies to incorporate attention into their research and into their teaching and to try to work towards a point at which you reach a tipping point. So you have a critical mass of researchers, institutes, and, um, and professors who are interested in adopting a focus on these issues, and then it, it flips and it becomes, the burden is on those who are not doing it to say why they're not doing it rather than vice versa. And, um, and I think that, frankly, you know, I, I said, and this is literally within the last two weeks, we got the approval for this certificate on gender, peace, and security. And I think that's um, sort of what happened at Georgetown. It was a very smooth process to get that certificate approved because it had become a foregone conclusion that we needed more of a focus on gender issues and that we needed more coverage of that. And so uh, people were actually had become thirsty for it, and there really wasn't uh, any pushback at all. Um, so um, some, some schools have been more aggressive, others have been less aggressive at mandating, uh, but I think the incentive based, the sort of positive incentive has, been, has worked better. Um, the, the issue of impact measure I'll leave for others, but I think part of it is the battle between quantitative and qualitative research as well, and on a lot of these issues, the need for qualitative with its devaluation often in certain faculties makes it really challenging uh, to combine the two. So I'll leave that there. On the issue of why it's hard, part of it is because um, I, the, there is, and I mentioned this a little bit, but there's, um, and this is a generalization and is not a universal truth. But there are a lot of, um, of the tenured faculty within institutions who are very resistant to change. They will claim uh, academic freedom when you're asking them to incorporate issues like SDGs or uh, issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion into curricula or into their research. Um, there's very little, there are very little few carrots and sticks that you can offer them to do things differently. And not only do they control what they're teaching and what they're researching, they also often control the hiring and the promotion process. Uh, and so bringing in um, new faculty with diverse research interests and diverse teaching interests then becomes quite hard. And so the leverage that academic administrators have over, um, over what takes place within the university as much as they may want to see transformation is somewhat constrained. Um, and while a lot of them are bringing in lecturers and what we call adjunct professors uh, to do teaching on a diverse range of subjects, those instructors are not as woven into the fabric of the university. And so it's very hard to have a kind of um, uh, trickle-down effect or a, or a impact more broadly on what's taking place at the university. The same is true for the research institutions in the United States, the research, and I think this is true writ large, there's a great deal of decentralization and so it's very hard to push that out, um, push out the work that's going on that's very good work in one place um, more broadly across the university. The issue of reparations I think was, um, so I happen to know this, the issue of reparations was a student driven uh, initiative. It started with students. Um, and then what, there was, I think, a responsiveness, but they would have actually liked to see much more being done that really ingrained um, issues related to, you know, reconciliation um, and reintegration and addressing reparations more broadly, becoming um, 
becoming part of the broader university discussion than they actually got. They felt like they bargained it away. For those who are not familiar, um, Georgetown University had a history, which I won't go into extensively, but of um, selling slaves and using the resources to pay for the expansion and construction on campus. And as a result of um, uh, a recognition of this, there was were um, uh, commitments made to the uh, the family members of the slaves who had been sold off, um, decisions made about renaming buildings, uh, recognition related to an acknowledgement of uh, the slave labor that had gone both into the construction of the university and then the 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 leveraging of slavery uh, to, to build and maintain that university. And I think it, it is an important model and it was, uh, to your point, a really important message that it sent. Um, uh, and I think the people who pushed for it would have wanted to see more. We also just decided to become carbon neutral as a school, which I think is terrific. But I don't know, it remains to be seen how that trickles to teaching, learning, research more broadly um, across the university. Uh, we almost have no time, but would you, would you like to add something to... to oh, I would just quickly say that um, in terms of creative strategies, I think we already all do a performance review process with our... You know, we fill out all this paperwork, and at the moment the criteria are the criteria, but there's no reason why if we're already spending this time doing this annual performance review as academics that they couldn't reshape that form and ask us some questions in relation to the SDGs to our curriculum and the SDGs to our research. Not, not to mandate it, mm -hmm. but just to help us draw those connections out and to give them the data that they then need um, to fill out forms later on down the track. Well, very briefly, I think I would just say carry on doing research for social impact and, and hopefully find the appropriate SDG along the way. If, if it doesn't uh, uh, have an SDG, then you should still do research for social impact. I think uh, um, the opportunities there are um, to use the SDGs that are there as a framework, so try, try to work towards them if you can, but that's, you shouldn't give up a, a good idea just because it doesn't fit an individual target or indicator. Well, I think it was a big pleasure and very interesting to listen to you. Uh, you provided us with uh, dense and deep food for thought and, uh, and new ideas and proposals. So thank you very much for, for, to the three speakers. Uh, SDG 16 is very relevant for our university mission. Um, we live in times of uh, multiple diversity, multi-level governance, ecological collapse, and successful populism. So we will have to reconsider also these principles of equality, liberty, and, uh, and, and, and social justice. So let us hope that we can work together and successfully on this relevant challenge in the years to come. So thank you very much. Thank you.